Um, I saw on the schedule that I was supposed to be talking about Benjamin Black. I'm not going to do that. I hope that's all right with everybody. Um, and uh, I also don't have the sexy uh, OzCon template, so uh, please tolerate our awesome logo. Um, so I'm going to talk today about data, information, and context, because they're not the same thing, although often uh, people treat them like the same thing. And uh, here we go. So what is this context thing? Because you're probably familiar with data and information. Well, context is information that's relevant, information that's timely, and information that's shareable. And this creates an environment for us in which we can operate, in which we can make decisions, in which we can uh, make cat social networks, uh, whatever it is that we need to do. Um, and the origination of my ideas of context really come from this concept that everyone should be familiar with called the OODA loop. Um, and I'm going to assume that you're not really that familiar with it and talk a little bit about it anyway. And uh, this should be your, your new religion in thinking about uh, data and your, and your work and operations and everything that goes on around you. Um, and so the OODA loop is this concept, uh, specifically an acronym stands for uh, absor uh, observe, orient, decide, act. And it came out of um, uh, air combat, Colonel John Boyd. Um, and turns out that Colonel Boyd is not much of an artist. Um, this is uh, apparently an informative diagram, although I've never found it to be so. Uh, but it captures that this is, in fact, very complex. This is a process, and in fact, looks a lot like uh, a lot of natural processes, a lot of biological processes. And as Colonel Boyd aged, he started talking more and more in those terms about the OODA loop as uh, sort of life in general. And the general idea is that you have all of these inputs uh, that you consume, you observe, and those inputs feed into this orient step. And the orient step is uh, a filtering process, uh, an analysis process. And the data is coming in, and it's going through all of your preconceptions and your biases and your training and whatever your history is, uh, and getting you to a certain decision. And finally, you take action. You actually execute on that decision. And then you start back again at the beginning. right? You observe the effects of your actions, uh, and so on and so on. And so you have this continuous process, the OODA loop. Um, now, there are aspects of this that um, are interesting. Uh, one of the core elements is that in air combat, and this is, of course, as all things must then be applied to business and books written about it. Uh, the intention is that you uh, iterate through this loop faster than your opponents, and by this process, win. And this is called getting inside your opponent's OODA loop. And in fact, you want to do more than get inside it. You want to disrupt it. And the means by which you disrupt it is chaos. Uh, one of the recurring themes in Boyd's writings and others in this area is that you must operate at the edge of chaos if you are to be successful in this. And that, in fact, your capacity for surviving chaos is a strong indicator of your ability to, to iterate faster and ultimately prevail in these situations. Now, I'm not so interested in the combative aspects of this, but I am really interested in this process whereby we take in data we analyze data, we make decisions, we act on them. And in particular, I'm interested in this notion that this is a process, this is not an end goal. Now, uh, also not much of a writer as it happens, uh, 
an interactive process of many-sided implicit cross-referencing projections, empathies, correlations, and rejections. And what you can hear here is uh, somebody with a really intense uh, mental model of exactly what's going on here and approximately zero ability to communicate that. <laughs> and so I'm going to attempt on his behalf to communicate it, but I'm going to start where he started, uh, which is fighter planes. And in particular, this plane. This is not a plane with which Colonel Boyd had anything to do and is in many ways uh, the culmination of a long history of um, plane design uh, based not on any sort of rigor or theoretical basis, but in many ways sort of the sign of the times. This is enormously fast, massive engines, utterly unmaneuverable, um, and had uh, nicknames like the Iron Pig. And if we look inside it, we see this wall of gauges, which appear to be uh, organized by size, maybe, from right to left. Um, it's not really clear. Um, but certainly not for any sort of human consumption, right? Um, so this really is this airborne muscle car, right? It goes really fast. It's got these incredibly primitive sensors, right? It was really exciting because it had radar. Uh, and very poor control design. Now, this plane was in production for a long time. It's still in use in various air forces. And uh, over time, there was lots and lots of upgrades to the sensors, to the interface. It even got a heads-up display later in its life. The Israelis put rear-view mirrors on it. That's not a joke. <laughs> um, but ultimately, this is sort of as far as you could push this, because the demands of combat, because of course this is designed to fight other planes being designed by other people who want to shoot it down. And uh, this was not really up to the task. And so in the midst of this, you have John Boyd, who was a fighter pilot in Korea, successful obviously as he, is, he was still alive to discuss this. And uh, he had developed uh, a number of theories uh, one of which is this whole OODA loop thing. Uh, a related one is actually a massive th uh, theoretical uh, mathy thing uh, that he developed with a mathematician at Elgin Air Force Base um, that fed into uh, the design of this. And so this, you'll note, looks really nothing like this other than it's got wings and a tail and stuff. It is significantly smaller only has one person in it. You'll see that canopy over that is one huge sheet of glass, or rather bubble of glass, to give incredible visibility all around. Uh, the angles down the side of the plane, actually very Mercedes-like in that they pay attention to what you can see down the sides, significantly more visibility there. The seat, in fact, is angled back significantly more than you would see in previous fighter planes where they might be at 12 or 13 degrees. The seat in the Falcon was tilted back at 30 degrees because this plane was designed to operate at sustained nine Gs, uh, at which point you would generally just black out. Uh, but by angling the seat back, you were able to uh, survive significantly higher accelerations. Now, looking inside, we see that this looks like something that you can actually recognize as designed to have a person in it. Uh, you see that the controls are no longer organized by size. There are, in fact, far fewer of them. A lot more of them are on the control stick. Uh, the control stick is no longer between your legs, but over to the sides where you would naturally rest your arms. Right? This was a plane designed to have a human in it. Now, it's still incredibly complicated. Let's not fool ourselves with that. I mean, I don't know what all that stuff does. Uh, but at least you can tell there was a plan. All right, so this plane uh, also was designed to operate at the edge of chaos, right? At subsonic speeds, the fighter is constantly on the verge of going out of control. 
that sounds like a lot of things other than a fighter plane. It sounds like a startup growing really fast. It sounds like a system that you're in the midst of scaling, right? You're always operating on the edge of control if you are pushing the envelope. So what was this? It was extremely maneuverable. It had these really advanced sensors, right? All kinds of forward-looking infrared, et cetera, et cetera. Very human-centric controls, right? This is a modern fighter plane, and it was designed uh, with a plan with a theoretical basis. So I'm skipping a couple of planes here, and we're going to jump to the thing that is the newest, uh, the F-35 Lightning II, which, despite being about the same size as the F-16, weighs about twice as much. That's magic. Um, that's the inside of it. Uh, it has one big screen. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, but wait. How could they possibly fit all that information on that one little screen? And the answer is, they don't. Uh, they turn you into uh, an anime bioroid with a head-mounted display. So this is the first plane that we've built and probably built in the world that was designed specifically to require a head-mounted display. You cannot fight this in this plane without that helmet on. And this helmet is honestly straight up science fiction. So those little bulbs up at the top are actually projectors that are pushing display information in. In daylight, it looks like a heads up display. And I don't know if you've ever seen in cockpit videos with the wilding, you know, wildly scrolling uh, information on both sides and the targeting and all that sort of stuff. And then at night, they overlay night vision with that. Uh, and in fact, will overlay vision from multiple sensors, a, a, something called sensor fusion, where they will take the visible light image uh, and then multiple infrared views of the same data and overlay them on top of each other so that you simultaneously see visible spectrum, near infrared, far infrared. Uh, and that sensor fusion uh, it presents you with this radically different view. Instead of trying to switch between views where you're looking over here and you're out a window and you're looking over here and you've got a heads-up display, you're continuously connected to the airplane. All right, so it's extremely maneuverable. Despite weighing twice as much as an F-16, it can maneuver about the same. Uh, it has a ridiculous array of sensors, which you would expect for a $200 million plane. Uh, and this control interface is straight up science fiction, right? This is incredible stuff. Uh, and the reason that you need this, of course, is because if you don't have the right context, right, the relevant timely shareable information, because these planes are connected continuously to uh, controllers, right, AWACS planes, that sort of thing, constantly communicating with each other, if you don't have that context, you die. Now, hopefully, uh, we don't have the same problems in scaling systems or in doing machine learning. Uh, but as we just saw, you can probably go cure cancer with the right tools, uh, which I'd find much more interesting than $200 million airplanes, but here we are. Um, right, so the context is, do I have the right information when I need it? Is it relevant? Is it timely? Is it shareable? So uh, that hideous... Uh, diagram up at the beginning, I try and distill it down for this web operations view of the world into something like this, right? This is one way of looking at it, observe, orient, decide, act, and we start over. And observing means, you know, we've got metrics and monitoring and alarming and alerting and all these data feeds coming into us, right? Uh, we orient to that. We have automated analysis of these things. We have visualization. Uh, we have automatic correlation. And then we try and decide, right? We plan, we resource, we discuss, et cetera, and then finally we act. And then that creates new observations, right? You can look at it this way. You can look at it like a funnel. Different ways of looking at it can, can cause you to think differently in terms of the decisions that you make. Um, but ultimately, you're doing the same thing, right? So now we come back to this thing, and it blah, 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 blah. Uh, and now it makes a little more sense, I think, right? Now it seems that we're talking about this process where we have tools, we have biases. And so we have this environment in which we operate. 
We have tools with which we observe that environment and the means by which we influence it. That is all that that says. So that I think we can actually take some action on and probably understand a little better. And so let's bring this around, right? This is a process. It is context. We have this environment, right? But it is not static. It is dynamic. It's constantly changing and evolving underneath us, right? And so the problem of big data is delivering context. Do I have the right information when I need it? And can I share it? And this challenges are we have this ever increasing sensor count and volume. The data dimensionality is exploding, right? We're going from three or four dimensions on a lot of data, right? We're talking about maybe time and measuring some other things. Maybe it's your disk IOPS or maybe it's visitors per second, who knows what, right? And we're getting this explosion, tens, hundreds of dimensions that we have to interact with. Uh, the expectations around latency, lower and lower latency, right? Higher and higher throughput. Uh, increasing need to collaborate. We have teams, we're not operating alone. And finally, we've got this ever-increasing population of users who may not understand how these tools work. They're trying to solve a problem, and if they have to understand deeply into the internals of the tools, they, they are not solving their problem, right? So these are all these challenges that are put in front of us, and these are what we have right this second, right? Our tools are not up to this. They cannot survive in this environment, but we are trying to make them. And so we have a proliferation of companies uh, around that, right? Folks like Cloudera, Datastacks, et cetera, are trying to make these consumable. But ultimately, the model itself is not necessarily up to the task. We may need new models, right? And so you've got tools like this, but we have the equivalent of the F4, right? It's big, it's slow, it's really awkward, and it's probably the end of the line for that mode of thinking. Now, what does the new thing look like? I don't know. And we can talk a little, oh, you, you know? Thank goodness, somebody knows. Whew, all right, I'm done. Okay, um, so there are probably a lot of ideas of what comes next. We certainly know what it needs to be able to do, but how it gets there, what is the theoretical underpinning? No idea, right? So we have these problems, we're overwhelmed by the data. So we try and crush down the dimensionality and then we lose a lot of information. It's very batch oriented. We have these information silos with all these different pieces of our data that we can't coordinate across. And finally, we have these incredibly complicated interfaces for interacting with them, whether it's directly programming MapReduce stuff or it's the interfaces which are kind of silly uh, to interact with a lot of these tools. And so the future of big data is tackling these problems, right? And so I wanna remind everyone as we go out into the rest of this conference that we are very much at the beginning of this. And while it may feel like this has been going on for a long time and man, we've got that big data thing sorted and now it's a matter of execution, we are not even close. And uh, to, to quote someone else, since we're all gonna talk about Amazon today, I think, uh, this is big data day one. And that's it.